after today's event. And on that note, as time is advancing, it's time to, to move to Icarset. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, if you're just joining us, uh, hi, wherever you are. Uh, you're very welcome to the Marathon Spotlight event, which is taking us on a 13-hour journey around the world. Today, as people celebrate the International Day of Women and Girls in Science, uh, we're taking the opportunity to celebrate our own fantastic community of women scientists who are leading the way in a wide range of research and scientific innovation. They're breaking barriers, they're finding new ways to advance the transformation of food, land and water systems in climate crisis. For those of you I haven't had the chance to meet before, hi, my name is Fiona Farrell. I lead CGIR's function that works to advance gender equity, diversity and inclusion uh, in our global workplaces, or GDI for short. Uh, we in the GDI function, we just celebrated our first birthday very recently. We were launched in late January 2020 uh, with a very clear mission uh, to work with leadership and management and staff across CGIR uh, to ensure that our workplaces are really truly inclusive uh, and, uh, and enabling for our over 10,000 people. Our goal is to ensure that diversity in all its dimensions is embraced and that every person in our workplace has, uh, has the support they need to reach their full potential. And for us, this is not just the right thing to do, it's really the smart thing to do. Uh, we know that diversity can bring the, the different perspectives and the innovation we need to deliver on our critical mission. Uh, the work of the GDI function is guided, as many of you may know, by our GDI framework and action plan. If you'd like to learn more about these important documents or about our knowledge hub or our guides or even our GDI matrix, which is the tool that we use to hold ourselves accountable, for delivery on the goals we've set. Uh, you can go straight to our GDI webpage and you can see the details on the screen right now. Uh, among the many initiatives we've had the chance uh, to support, the chance and the honor, I would say, to support, um, has been the launch of a new employee-led uh, resource group called WIRES, Women in Research and Science. And WIRES is bringing together all those in our global community uh, who are seeking to support the incredible women scientists, uh, providing them with supportive and safe places to meet, uh, to learn, to grow and to advance. And today's event follows on very closely from the official launch of WIRES on the 21st of January. Um, we're recognizing the significant contributions of these women scientists by showcasing a sample of the exciting and innovative work that's going on around CGIR. Now, as we continue our 13 hour journey, we're going to take a second to quickly remind you of a few housekeeping rules. As you can see on the screen, uh, we're also going to remind you that an interpretation function is available for those of you who are new to Zoom and, and are not used to seeing the interpretation button. Um, it's that uh, circle, that globe image on the very bottom of the screen. Uh, we invite you to submit your questions and your comments via the Q&A box, which we're monitoring. And if you have any problems uh, or any technical difficulties, please do feel free to reach out to Thomas. Um, we also invite you to join WIRES. Uh, the contact details are on the right-hand side. It is now my great pleasure uh, to welcome the speakers for our fourth Power Hour today, uh, handing over to Agath in Ikrisat. You're very welcome. Off you go. Uh, thank you very much, Fiona. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the Ikrisat session is now starting and uh, we thank Imi for also passing the baton to us. And uh, we are really delighted to be part of this uh, innovative initiative of YRS, uh, Women in Research and Science. And we are honored uh, so this morning also to, to have in this session our Director General, uh, Dr. Jacqueline Yush. Uh, who is uh, also giving our inaugural address. Uh, we have speakers uh, coming from all over the world. Uh, this morning with us, we have uh, Dr. Vania Azevedo. She's our head of Gene Bank uh, in India. We also have with us today, uh, Dr. Pooja uh, Batnaga. She's also a molecular breeder. And we have uh, in this uh, discussion this morning, uh, Dr. Rebi Arawa, 
uh, regional and research program director in uh, Eastern and Southern Africa. She's also country representative uh, in, uh, in Kenya. So really interesting session ahead of us. And uh, we won't take too much time before we start the introduction because we have also uh, already five minutes uh, gone. And so to start uh, this session, I would like to call upon our Director General who is joining us today to please uh, share her uh, welcome address to this session. Uh, Jackie, good morning, uh, good afternoon say in India and uh, welcome to you. Thank you. So if I could just start by saying women scientists play an indispensable role in the CGIR's mission to end hunger by 2030. We're in the forefront. We're not always recognized. Women are 29% of our workforce. Female researchers and scientists power our innovation, but we need support to thrive. So ICRISAT is happy to join the CGIR family on this 11th of February to celebrate the International Day of Women and Girls in Science. The day focuses on the reality that science and gender equality are both vital for the achievement of internationally and nationally agreed development goals. At ICRISAT, we believe that SDGs can be achieved when full and equal access to and participation in science for women and girls happens, and further gender equality and empowerment of women is guaranteed. It's sad that we have to say, should be guaranteed. It should be natural. We never hear the plea for men and boys to have their contribution guaranteed, but perhaps there will be a day that that is so. The recent launch of the new CGIR employee-led research resource group, my apologies, called WIRES, Women in Research and Science, is a great milestone in this journey. It's also a great example of the innovative ways we're using to explore, to advance gender diversity and inclusion in our work and delivery. The contributions by women and girls in sciences, I believe, and I'm sure you feel, has suffered from, suffered from stereotypes. There's always a certain kind of woman fitting into a certain kind of men's environment. We've got to increase the visibility of women in research, increase the visibility of women professionals, ensuring voices are not only heard, but listened to and contributions recognized and valued. This marathon, and marathon it is, is a great opportunity. And I'd like to thank the Women in Science and Research Employee-Led Resource Group for holding this and asking me to speak. Our panel today highlights the work, the truly excellent work of women scientists and how they're contributing to ICRISAT's mandate. Our first speaker, Rebi Harawai, is looking at how women scientists at the forefront of the fight against COVID-19 have used digital innovation systems to deliver agricultural technologies during the lockdown. Vanya Azevedo, the head of our gene bank, will take us through the experience of genetic resources, conservation and promotion. And finally, Puja Bhatnagar will share her experience about molecular breeding. We recognize that initiatives like this knowledge sharing marathon are easy ways for people to get together and to make the workplace more fun, more informative and globally connected around GDI, gender diversity and inclusion. I wish that all our environments were as fun, but let's make the most of this one. This event, this marathon provides an additional channel through which staff, especially our women scientists can speak up, share ideas and their unique perspectives. Because it's the women, the women scientists themselves that mainly organize this initiative, I believe it could and should evolve over time to meet not only our current needs, and the needs which we've brought with us from the past, but our future needs in a very inclusive manner. 
I'd like to encourage the Women in Research and Science employee-led resource group that we're talking about to continue this dialogue that we hear in this marathon and to highlight GDI in various fora, as I just did in um, an event, an ICAR event on pulses with Ikrasat and Ikarda and the Indian Institute of Pulses Research. Do it freely, bring it in whenever you can, the needs of women in science. For, focus on it for career development, for our work-life work balance, as well as developing mentoring opportunities, which is also simply put as help each other and support each other. So Agath, over to you. I'm looking forward to hearing the first speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jackie, for really these inspirational words. You are not only our DG, but you're also an inspiration to all of us. Uh, prominent scientists, you are an excellent science manager and a leader in research and development. So please stay with us and we now uh, introduce uh, a video by, by Vanya. We change a bit uh, the, the order. We wanted to show first the, the gene bank and the fantastic work that they are doing there uh, to maintain our genetic resource and also promote the use of it. So welcome uh, Vanya. Vanya is uh, the head uh, gene bank. Uh, she's based in India and Vanya, uh, uh, Join Ikrisat after a rewarding uh, career working in plant genetic research in the, with the Brazilian Agricultural Research Corporation, Ambrapa. She has applied uh, her expertise to ensure that crop diversity is entrusted to her is, and safeguarded. Uh, today, she uh, has a video introducing you to Ikrisat Gene Bank and the importance of the resource to the world. So let's see the, the video that you have, Vanya, and we'll talk after. Thank you. Thank you, Agatha. I will share my screen. I hope it works. Can you see it? Here yes, I can see it. Okay. <laughs> of the Monday crops that Ikrisat is working with, sorghum, pear millet, finger millet, chickpea, pig and pea and groundnut, and other five small millets. Our objective is to maintain the diversity of this material, of these crops, and provide this material to all the users uh, inside ICRZ and outside ICRZ and also outside India. ICRZ gene bank concerns the largest uh, collections of gene plus, particularly if you take sorghum. The Secret is the largest collection in the world and it can serve over 41,000 gem plasma oxygen. It provides diversity to the researchers that what is needed. We have about 41,000 gem plasma oxygen of sorghum originating from uh, 92 countries and uh, we have about uh, 23,000 gem plasma oxygen of pearl millet originating from 52 countries and uh, we have about uh, 11,500 uh, oxygen of uh, small millet, six small millets. That six small millets include finger millet, foxtail millet, coso millet, barnyard millet, kodo millet, and little millet. In this season, we used to decide how much in, uh, accessions, how many accessions we have distributed, and how many we have to multiply the accessions, and how many we are having poor viability and poor quantity. Then we will go for regeneration and uh, multiplication. Actually, some accessions which the uh, which we are collected as a land race from the farmers' field, now it is not there. So it's like a backup, even for the farmers' community, farming community. Right now, we have conserved around one lakh, uh, one hundred and eleven thousand accessions are already safely duplicated in small birds. The seeds are there in black box. Uh, they still belong to Ecrisat. We are the only ones who can access that material if necessary. But it's a way to have another safety copy of the entire collection in a different country. And every year we have new material, so every year we have to send a new accessions to Svalbard to guarantee a copy of the entire collection. Diversity within crop is record for sustainable agriculture, and diversity among crops is also record for sustainable agriculture for food and nutritional security. So we need to enhance and broaden the genetic base of cultivar to sustain the agriculture. So that's the main purpose of our team bank, to, to maintain the food security of our future generations. 
gene banks everywhere are very important in a way to guarantee the conservation of the diversity of the crops. For the scientists to be able to answer very fast to the different demands, so we never know what is coming and the demands are changing. In the past, we were always focusing on yield. Now we are more interested in nutrition. We, we have a different disease. We have climate change. So how we need to work with this material and make them adapted to the different kind of environments. So gene banks are very important in a way to guarantee the conservation of the biggest diversity as possible to allow us to answer to all these changes and to all these demands. I'm Vanya, and we are the Icrisat Gene Bank. So much uh, Vania for this uh, excellent video on the wonderful work that you are doing at uh, Ecclesia Gene Bank there. We will be right back to you for more questions and insight uh, about your work. Uh, but uh, now we'd like to introduce the, the next speaker, uh, Dr. Pooja Bhatnaga. Uh, she has a presentation today which is entitled Enabling Platform Technologies and advanced breeding intervention to our intractable and innovative threat in crop breeding. This is really very scientific. Uh, we welcome uh, Pooja, and she will be also sharing a, a slide uh, presentation. Good, good morning, uh, good afternoon, Pooja. Please over to you for your presentation. Good afternoon, Agat, and hello, everyone. Uh, I'll just try to share my screen. Yes, please. If you can please give me a second. I don't know why it is asking me preferences. Oh. Agat, can you do it for me from there, please? Because I have just one slide, because I don't know why it's giving me a problem. It's I'm unable to okay. share my screen. Let me try. Sorry about that. Um, please bear with us as we saw this, this out. <laughs> um, Rajani, can you share from your slides, please? Uh, yes, I will do it on my end. Uh, just hold on. Okay. Okay. Uh, can can you see it? it? Yes. Yes, it can see. Rajni, can you put it in a screen, uh, full screen mode, please? Yes. Great. Okay. Can you? Okay, I think. All right, yeah, there you go. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, thank you for uh, inviting me to talk today uh, and share our work briefly, what we have been doing at ICRISAT around uh, uh, enabling platform technologies and advanced breeding interventions for future traits or maybe intractable traits for our crop breeding pipelines. Rajni, can you please take me to the next slide? Okay, uh, so before I go any further with what we do here uh, in, in my lab at ICRISAT, 
um, I think Vanya has sort of given a snapshot of how important the uncultivated germplasm is, uh, which is uh, kept in our gene banks and CG is um, holding material interest uh, for countries and there is an international agreement in place for sharing, use and distribution of this material. Uh, I, I'll be just taking you to the other side of things uh, around, you know, uh, the, the traits that are really not available in the elite breeding populations and the breeders, you know, they are not able to sort of tap into the germplasm for some of the future traits uh, in, uh, in a scenario where uh, we operate as on today, the complex farming systems that face challenges of poverty, malnutrition, and uh, unsustainable use of natural resources. And, and for that, we would need integrated solutions. So the work that we do in my lab at Ikrasat, the headquarters in Hyderabad, is around bringing that kind of or inducing that kind of variability which is not available with either the breeders or with the with the gene bank you know for immediate use so we are involved in essentially developing the basic and applied knowledge uh, to develop the egg biotech and advanced breeding interventions and uh, before I go any further you know as a molecular biologist I believe that you know in order to achieve something that we have never had it's important to do something that has not been done Done before. So my team here is, uh, you know, we are striving to integrate the aspects of fundamental biology, tissue culture, genomics, forward and reverse genetic approaches, and now um, catch, catching up with the advanced breeding techniques or what you also know as new breeding techniques to produce agriculture crop products by design. So these are more future ready and they can be deployed in the, in the future breeding pipelines. And what we do here is using the cut edge tools and technologies. We improve the genetics of the crops, include uh, crops that we term as GLDC crops like chickpea, pigeon pea, groundnut, sorghum, and pearl millet for future readiness. Uh, and of course, for contribution to sustainable agriculture, poverty reduction, nutritional impacts towards the SDGs. So what we do here is sort of bringing what we have in the gene bank closer to to the breeding uh, material, you know, what the farmers would eventually have as varieties growing in their field. So it aligns uh, the breeding priorities, of course, bringing innovative solutions for accelerating the varietal development for these very important food and nutritional security crops. And over years, my team in collaboration with various national and international partners, both in public and private sectors have demonstrated breakthroughs in tackling a number of seemingly very difficult or what we also call intractable problems that have eluded conventional plant breeding approaches for several decades. So that, that has been our you know, constant effort to bring these solutions to the forefront and so that they can be deployed by the breeding pipelines. And some of these examples, the work that is going on in the lab includes uh, targeted interventions for striga resistance in sorghum and pearl millet, aflatoxin mitigation in groundnut, in pigeon pea, we are working, uh, we are doing some very basic work on uh, tailoring the reproductive plasticity uh, to make early flowering or photoperiod insensitive pigeon pea varieties uh, to produce elite cultivars that are geographically adapted so that, you know, they are not just in, uh, you know, grown in uh, one niche, but they could be sort of expanded to future niches as well. And uh, besides that, in terms of output traits, we are working on traits like increasing the shelf life of uh, a nutri cereal like pearl millet, which is a very healthy cereal. However, it has an issue of shelf life of a milled flower and that is being addressed to improve not only the you know um, the to sort of support uh, interventions for reducing the drudgery for the women of the households but also to also link this very important gluten-free cereal to the markets and and sort of bring uh, bring it closer to the value chains so these are some of the examples that we have been working around you know playing around with with the genes with the DNAs and, and sort of having cutting edge technologies being deployed for varietal development. Uh, 
Besides that, you know, uh, we also have uh, in a quest of uh, speeding the pace of the biotech and gene editing trade pipelines, uh, we have been trying our hands on developing the rapid uh, cycling methods for the crops. This is much close to the work that the breeders do to accelerate the vegetative to reproductive transition. And since every crop is unique in its way, how it responds to the set of environmental parameters, we mimic the right set of light, temperature, humidity to convince the plant to really grow faster, much faster than it usually does, and at a higher density to reproduce quickly. And not, not only it, you know, it enhances the cycle uh, of the plant, it also significantly shortens the breeding cycle somewhere around 40 to 50 percent of what a variety development would otherwise take if we go the conventional way. So this is what we call it as a rapid gen method, a rapid generation cycling method in conjunction with uh, a range of uh, breeding acceleration techniques has the potential to take advantage of modern methods to increase the crop genetic gains. So this is a nutshell what we have been doing in our lab. And not only we have successfully developed tools and technologies for research and innovations for ICRISAT mandate crops, uh, we, are, we are cognizant about our engagement with partners and stakeholders on integrating the discovery research that is being done in the lab to the translational research activities, including risk assessments, regulatory and stewardship aspects, and to be able to provide the additional dimensions and responsibly maturing the innovative genetic solutions for agriculture, that is definitely going to be the need of the R as we move forward. So that's all from me. Thank you, Agat. Agat, you are muted. Sorry, we want to know more about your expertise in, in this field. So we'll come back to you uh, for more questions. And before that, I uh, would like now to go into more uh, presentation, this time with uh, Rebi Arawa. She's uh, our regional and research program director in ASEAN in Southern Africa. And I'd like to all hand over to Rajani this time uh, to guide us through the discussion or the presentation with uh, Rebi Arawa. Uh, Rajani, over to you, please. Okay, so uh, welcome, Dr. Rebi. Uh, as Agat mentioned, Rebi is uh, the Regional and Research Program Director of Eastern and Southern Africa. And um, today she's going to tell us a little bit about uh, how they used uh, digital innovations um, to deliver agricultural solutions in Kenya. Uh, over to you, Rebi. Welcome. Yes, we, we shall share the screen of uh, Rebi uh, for Rebi this time also. Let uh, me... Are you going to screen it? Are you going to share the screen? Uh, yes, thank I you. Thank you very, okay. Thank you very much uh, for the introductions. Uh, before I get into sharing our uh, work around digital innovation and how we have been able to deliver agricultural technologies during the COVID-19. I just want to briefly say about myself uh, in line with uh, you know, the theme, uh, women in science. I am a soil scientist uh, by training. I've been involved in the development of uh, Soil of fertility technologies. Uh, soil of fertility is a very critical element in crop productivity, particularly here in sub Saharan Africa, where the average uh, crop yields are actually 35% of uh, the world average. Uh, coming to my role at ICRISAT, uh, I'm responsible for leading and management the ICRISAT research program here in Eastern Southern Africa. And uh, we have work around crop uh, development, uh, crop uh, technology development, uh, but also the development of integrated uh, agronomic solutions. Uh, so the work that uh, my colleagues have said earlier on, uh, we also have uh, similar work uh, taking place here in Eastern Southern Africa. Uh, very critical for areas uh, in the, uh, this part of the world, 
uh, in countries like uh, East Africa, Kenya, we have uh, nearly 80% of the land which is uh, classified as arid and semi-arid. So crop technologies, uh, for example, the drought tolerant crops, they play a very critical role when it comes to food nutrition security, but also income. And as I mentioned, integrated soil uh, agronomic solution or integrated water, watershed management is also very critical. Uh, we also uh, play a role in development of uh, seed uh, delivery models. Uh, the technologies that we develop, we don't just develop uh, varieties and put them on the shelf, but we also work uh, in partnership with public and private sector to make sure that these varieties are reaching the smallholder farmers, most of which are women. Uh, so we have uh, a lot of uh, models that we have delivered, that we have developed, uh, that are working really to make sure that improved varieties are in the hands of the farmers. And uh, finally, the area of enabling environment for the R and D. Uh, this is uh, around markets, but also policy research. Uh, this is very critical in ensuring that the research that we are doing is actually uh, working in a, an environment uh, that is able to uh, create a sustainability of natural resources, but also the livelihoods. Uh, with uh, those uh, a few introductory remarks, I just want to share at this point, as I mentioned that uh, we are working on uh, facilitating the delivery of technologies I think this is in line with uh, this year's uh, theme, which is uh, women in leadership, achieving an eco future in a COVID-19 world. I thought that I could share with you practically uh, some of the solutions that we have been able to apply in a COVID-19 situation, which I think took the world by surprise. So with that, I'd like to share with you a few slides that I have. Shall, shall we go? Yes, please. Oh. Do you see the do you see the slides? I can't see them. Ooh. No, not yet, Agatha. So as Agatha is uh, trying to tweak the technology, just to uh, <laughs> say that uh, here in Kenya, when we had the COVID lockdowns, uh, which started in March, it was uh, at the very critical stage of agriculture. It was at a time when uh, the main cropping season was starting. And this is the time when farmers, they need to have access to seeds, and uh, you, as you know that uh, the lockdowns continued from March to almost part of the year. So you are basically looking at the whole cropping cycle, uh, you know, beyond accessing seeds, they need to have extension advisory. Uh, they need to be guided on the, agro you know, the agronomy, uh, the spacing, they need to be guided on the weeding. And uh, throughout the whole cropping season, they also need to get uh, a place where they need to sell uh, their crops. So it's everything that has to do with agriculture uh, found itself in these lockdowns. Uh, I think most of the movements in this, uh, you know, in the city uh, were basically restricted. And um, most of the people basically that provide all the solutions that we are talking about, the extension advisory services, we are not able to do it. But because of the uh, digital innovations uh, that we have, I think we are able to reach out uh, to smallholder farmers uh, by providing them uh, the digital solution, by providing them the agricultural advisory services uh, that we are talking about. So uh, I, I can now see the, the slides. Uh, can you put them in a presentation mode? Yes, I'm uh, doing that now. OK, great.
Okay, next slide. Okay, so the digital uh, for agriculture is uh, another area that uh, uh, ICRISAT uh, is focusing on. Our objective is to have a better, faster, and cheaper delivery through digital technology. And this cuts across uh, all the areas of the R&D that we are doing from breeding informatics, analytics, uh, to delivering uh, data on real time mobile, mobile devices, uh, digital services, GIS, internet. So it encompasses all the work that we are doing. Uh, next slide. So as I mentioned, uh, that we are taken unaware, uh, like in our case here, we are implementing a project in partnership with government, uh, CGIR, CGIR centers and private sector, where we are uh, accelerating value chain uh, development uh, of uh, drought tolerant crops. For example, the uh, legumes uh, like pigeon peas, and also cereals like sorghum and millets. So as I indicated, this came at a, the, the, the lockdowns came at a time when farmers needed to uh, start planting. And uh, we were able to deliver information uh, in terms of uh, climate, uh, weather. It's very critical in the areas uh, where we are working uh, because of uh, the uh, rainfall situation. We are always, you know, we are required to guide farmers. Uh, what week should they plant? Uh, what day should they plant? And how should they plant? And that information, we were able to deliver it uh, through our digital platforms. Uh, but going further, even delivering the good agronomic practices, uh, guiding them in terms of all the agronomies that are required, uh, market information, but also the nutrition information. I think most of you are aware that COVID at the very beginning, it was very clear that uh, people need to have good nutrition in order to have uh, resistance in their bodies. And so it was very critical that this information should be able to reach uh, the communities that we work with. So uh, by the end of uh, the year, we are able to, the cropping season, we are able to uh, deliver, uh, you know, several messages, uh, 900,000 SMSs uh, with a lot of uh, interaction between the extension staff as well as the farmers, uh, reaching out to 22,000 households, out of which 60% uh, were actually women. And with these messages, you can see that they were, they were able to cascade them on the nutrition aspect, even bringing the uh, other communities where they were able to share this information. So in a nutshell, this is what I wanted to share in how we have been able uh, to use our innovations uh, to advance the agricultural technologies during this uh, COVID-19 lockdowns here in Kenya. Uh, thank you very much. Over to you, Agatha. Thank you so much, uh, Rebi. Uh, we are now going into our uh, discussion, our moderator discussion. So you will be coming back uh, again and discuss with us. And uh, let's start the discussion with uh, Vania. I remember she presented uh, the video on the, the gene bank work at the very beginning of this session. And uh, you also did uh, some work during the COVID-19 time as uh, Rebi also was doing in uh, Eastern and Southern Africa. So Vania, we would like also to hear from you about your work, especially during COVID-19 time. Over to you, please. Thank you, Agatha. Uh, it, it's, it's very, it was very interesting and challenging, I can say. Uh, so at the gene bank, as, as was very clear in the video, we need to conserve the, the, the accessions to guarantee that the research, the agriculture research will continue and will happen all around the world. Uh, our gene bank has a very big responsibility with the crops that we conserve. 
we already distributed accessions to 148 countries. So uh, we can say that the entire world depends on us to develop agricultural research on these crops. And our biggest responsibility at the gene bank is to guarantee that the seeds will be there, well conserved, alive, and able to be used no matter what is happening and how challenging the situation is. So uh, we were very lucky during the COVID time because of the ICRIS at infrastructure. So we could uh, uh, put some staff living inside the ICRIS at. We had 14 hectares to harvest. New accessions that came from Africa. We had a few hundreds of accessions that had just arrived from Africa. They were in the field and from our regional gene banks, most of them. And uh, if we didn't harvest them, we were going to lose them. And lots of materials being regenerated. So we had a, a task force, a workforce. Even my husband went to the field with us to harvest the materials. Uh, Peter Carberry was our DG during the lockdown. Even Peter was going to the field. He, he used to message and say, I have a free day. Where are you now? I'm going to help you harvest. So you will not lose any of the accessions because our responsibility is with all the scientists working with our crops. We could manage. We have a very good team. Uh, interesting that the entire gene bank team is 51 staff, including in Zimbabwe and Niger, not only in India. And we are only 10 women. Uh, all the other are men, uh, and, uh, but it, it's, it's a very dedicated team and we could uh, manage well and we didn't lose a single accession, but, but it was really, really challenging. Yeah, excellent work, uh, Vanya. I actually saw you and your team uh, during the, this time on the field on social media, and it was really great to see uh, on various uh, ways that you are still uh, on the field at this very difficult time. So uh, uh, let's also see uh, and hear more detail from, from uh, Rebi. Uh, you mentioned about a very innovative way that you use uh, during this lockdown, lockdown uh, using a digital uh, technique and to, to, to do your work during this uh, lockdown. So please, uh, what was so specific during this time, uh, Rebi? Yeah, thank you very much for that. Uh, you know, likewise, we had to make sure that uh, business continued. So apart from delivering the technologies to the communities, uh, the small order farmers, uh, we made sure that uh, even in our own work, in our own research fields, there was also uh, continuity of business. And uh, one of the critical thing was, of course, making sure that uh, the healthy and the, the health and the safety of staff was very critical. So as you would imagine, our work involves sitting in the lab, but also going to the uh, research field. So one of the things that we really made sure is uh, that all the workforce, they were well equipped with the uh, PPEs that you all know now what the PPE is. But also we made sure that we used all the digital platforms. As I mentioned, I think uh, uh, in terms of our work, we have made sure that we have digitized every part of our R&D. So for example, if you talk about data collection, uh, a lot of the information was really, you know, you harvest data and you enter it immediately and then you transmit it uh, you know, to the next scientists, to the next field technicians. Uh, but we also made sure that uh, we had to use these platforms, uh, literally where you're talking to somebody who is sitting in the field, uh, you know, 100 miles away from where you are. And uh, I think that really worked very well. And of course, once in a while with the social distancing, we had to make sure that people were on the ground. But even more importantly, I think the partnership that we have established in our research networks, because we are working with uh, the national partners, the private, the private sector partners, most of them in the, those locations where they had uh, some uh, movements allowed, I think they were able to backstop our research work. So partnership really worked very, very, very well, uh, you know, adding on to the technologies uh, that we have just talked about. 
Thank you very much, uh, Rebi. We'll uh, now also turn to Puja. But before I just like to remind people that the translation is still available into French for those who are, are listening into that language. And uh, Puja, we'll get, get back to you about uh, your, the science that you are really doing wonderful work at uh, ICRISAT. Uh, we had this question when we were just pre preparing uh, this session. Uh, what is one of the most important lessons you've learned as uh, in your journey as a woman scientist, what you actually presented is really excellent work, but for a woman, there might some be also some challenges that you have faced in, in the journey before we see you as who you are today. I uh, would like to know more about that. Okay, thank you, Agat. Uh... Before I answer that question, actually, I would like to just say that it's the attitude that's the foundation of success. And attitude is not like, an, like a handkerchief, like his or hers. So, you know, attitude is attitude, you know, irrespective of what the gender is. And so uh, I believe, and I have been, you know, raised in a family of all girls. I believe that you know being tenacious and dogged towards your goals and aspirations is what a woman scientist, or for that matter, any woman, you know, is, uh, must strive for. Uh, so that that is something I, I strongly believe in. And now, coming to your question on you know what's an important lesson, uh, I think you know I have myself faced uh, what we call an assertive assertiveness penalty. And I feel the women scientists, you know, who really breach the gender stereotype, they do face a backlash. And that really puts them in a very tenuous position. It's a conundrum, you know, uh, because traditionally men, it's, it's assertiveness is uh, seen more as a men's forte. And, you know, and, but I, I, I believe that assertiveness is something that's required among women now. And uh, otherwise, we will be just continue to seen as, you know, backstage workers who run the risk of their voices being ignored. So what I have learned because of these experiences all these years, you know, um, right from childhood, actually, and also in the professional sphere now, is that uh, I've learned that, you know, navigating that assertiveness backlash, I like to call it, is although very tough, but it's extremely critical. And, you know, uh, it's important that the women scientists integrate assertiveness with fluidity. And that is very helpful in bringing the ability to dynamically steer the decisions. And they, the decisions then seem to be more aligned with the sustainable results. So I have seen it for myself and a lot of other female colleagues, you know, the, the and also the mentors who have uh, really shared their experiences uh, for that. And also I was a part of a CGIR women leadership course and I have learned quite a bit. I know I've done that course with you, in fact, Agat. And not only, you know, I have picked this uh, and I try to do it as much as possible. And this has helped me in not only utilize, utilizing my talent more effectively, but it also brings a clarity of focus. And, you know, and it keeps on, you know, uh, and the perseverance you would need to really going all that distance that you need to cover. So I believe that is, I can say one that is something that I would like to Thanks so much, Puja. Uh, I do remember this course. And uh, yes, I now hand over to, to Rajani. I think she has more questions in the same line uh, to the panelists again. Yes, I do. It was fascinating what Puja had to say about the assertiveness backlash. That's a, a good term that you put. But I, I believe a lot of women face that. Uh, my question is to uh, Rebi. Um, Rebi, uh, having reached where you have today as a senior scientist, um, what do you feel are the uh, biggest challenges that women and uh, girls in science face? I mean, from your experience and looking at other women scientists who you might have worked with, what do you think are the biggest challenges? Yeah, first of all, I think we have to remind ourselves why we need women and girls in science. 
in the global science, in the global south, we are talking about between 60 and 90% of women engaging in agriculture productivities, uh, but also have the responsibility of providing, you know, services in the homes from water, energy, and sanitation. So it's very critical that we have scientists who are women to understand these areas where women are playing a very critical role. We need a science that applies a gender lens in all these aspects. Now, in my own experience, I think one of the areas where we are really having challenge is in the area of mentorship. Uh, the Africa Academy of Science, uh, they carried a study and they found out that actually women role model, they play 24% uh, of the influence of women, women or girls to be in science comes from women role model. So those of us who have now reached this level, we need to make sure that we are playing that role of mentorship. I think every woman who is in this uh, uh, platform today, we should ask ourselves at this point, how many women, how many girls am I mentoring? Everyone needs to have a target goal. In my lifetime, before I retire, I have to have X number of women, girls, that I'm going to move together. That doesn't mean that men should not do it. But I think women, we play a very critical role. The other area is bias and discrimination. Let's face it, we live in a very patriarchal society, particularly here in Africa. There is always preferential treatment for the boy, for the men, and all the gender stereotypes. We have, again, to get to a place where this stereotype, we should face it. Let's have a culture, a society, which is very open. I know that in most societies, we don't want to talk about this biasness. But unfortunately, because we don't talk about it, we find that people carry this when they are going to their careers. Again, I want to quote uh, a study which was carried out by the National Academy of Science, uh, Engineering and Medicine. They actually found out that 20 to 50% of the female students, they were harassed sexually. This is a study. And where did this come from? Faculty, their supervisors, why? Because the society doesn't want to face this head on. So we all have a responsibility at every point. And those of us who are in this leadership role, those of us who are at a point where we can influence a society, I think we have to be very open. We have to be very candid, have this conversation. In our coffee breaks, let's make this as a topic of discussion to make sure that it gets out of people's head, no biasness, no gender stereotypes against women and girls. Over to you. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Rebi. That was a great uh, and very impassioned uh, response. And I'm sure all of us were nodding our heads when we heard your uh, statements. Uh, so taking off from that question, uh, I would further like to ask, uh, and this time I would like uh, inputs from all three of our panelists, uh, starting maybe from you, Vanya, and then Pooja, and then Rebi can add on. Um, what do you think, uh, or where do you see, how do you see organizations and research centers uh, evolving in such a way that they are more supportive of women and uh, girls in science? What, what should they be doing more? Uh, what do you, you think? And uh, in the interest of time, I would request you to keep your answers short and to the point. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Rajani, for uh, pointing this out. We are only have a few minutes and let's uh, also be very short because our DG is still here with us. We want to hear from her before we conclude. So please. Well, from the, the Institute's perspective, I think it's, it's important that people started considering it as one of the goals of the Institute, right? The gender balance and to, to discuss, to, to highlight how important this is. 
but I, I, I waiting, I'm still waiting to see more effective actions. Because just to, to put there the gender balance and the gender platform or whatever, it will not solve the, the issues and all the things that we, we go through on a daily basis. Right? Implementation the is also important. Yeah, the stereotype is there. If we are too strong, we are hysterical. If we are too emotive, we are just a woman who is too emotive. So there is always this bias with women. And uh, I, I, I'm still here because I decided to ignore and continue working because I know what I'm doing and I know that I'm good in what I'm doing. And uh, here I am now. Uh, but this is there on our daily work. And so more than talking and having platforms and an event like this that I believe that 90% are women. So we are just talking to ourselves. We are not most probably not reaching most of the men, which are the majority of the CGIR. Uh, but it's a start, but it's a very small start. We have much more to do. Thank you. Thank you. Pooja, your take on this. I think I agree with what Vanya said, you know, if you really want to have a great party, you just don't need to invite people. We also need to make them dance somehow. And, you know, it's important, right? You know, while we have these quotas of bringing more and more women in organization, there are policy level decisions happening, which is a good beginning. But we also need to make sure that there is a need to create a culture in the organizations that facilitates women scientists and women professionals in navigating the systems which are actually historically designed for men. So, you know, we, that, that kind of a cultural change is important. And I believe, you know, that is something that the, the next level of, we are having this conversation and that's, that's probably is the next level of uh, evolution. Okay. So, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we are facing really constraint of time. So, for the sake of time, I would like uh, to ask for the maybe the latest question to uh, our director general, and she will also conclude our our meeting. Uh, dear Jackie, what are something you feel a young uh, scientist needs? in order to succeed in science and career, and perhaps in life also. And we also mentioned about uh, these uh, gender bias and also what the institution need to do. So please, uh, over to you to advise. Thank you, Agat. I've got four very short points. All the ICRASAT staff know that I'm very short and sharp in what I say. The first one, <laughs> Be confident in what you know and in what you believe. The second one, be yourself. Don't try to be something or someone that you are not. What you are and who you are is really precious. A plea to all the women here, watch recruitment very carefully. Never let men or women put women as the first choice candidate if they are not. That's even worse. And when the woman finds out she was in that position because she is a woman, that is so patronizing and impossible to live with. And lastly, remember that diversity is very important. Women are different, be different, and revel in it. Thank you, Aga. Thanks so much. So brief, <laughs> so powerful. And I also like to <laughs> to thank our panelists. Uh, really, uh, Jackie, thanks for staying for this uh, long hour with us. And uh, thank you also to the Arawa, to Vanya, to Puja, and also to Rajani, who is uh, co-moderating this event uh, with. It has been a great pleasure. And if you have more questions, we couldn't take the question. So please send an uh, email to us and we, we shall reach out to you. Uh, it may take a while, but uh, sure that we answer to you. Thank you very much for uh, attending the session. I, I also thank Imi who passed the button uh, to us. I saw the message of Raquel before this. Uh, she was wishing us the best, uh, the best love for this session. 
So thank you very much and uh, have a good day, good uh, evening and uh, of you, Fiona. Thank you so much. Thanks so much to Jackie and, and Vania and Pooja and, and Rebi and Agatha and, and Rajani for a, a really enjoyable and enlightening session. Uh, from where I sit, having been in all the sessions, it's, it's amazing to see that there are some common themes that are continuing uh, to rise throughout the discussion. And one of them is really the importance of role modeling and mentoring. That's been brought up, I think, in almost all of the sessions. But I mean, also some really important points there around bias and, and discrimination. And, and, uh, and I like the phrase assertiveness penalty. Uh, really nice point there as well. And thanks so much, Jackie, for, for that great advice. Uh, merci beaucoup also to our great interpreters, Helene and Isabel. Um, 